The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ztalk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Welcome, and tonight from the Dark Shadows, we have best-selling true crime author Ron Francel, known for great books like Delivered from Evil and The Darkest Night. We're going to talk to him about writing true crime right after these words. Now, for the House of Mystery, Case Files. A maddened former Marine, a 24-year-old student in the architectural school named Charles Whitman, first killed his wife and mother in their home. Then he fled to the top of the University Tower, a 27-story building, and from there shot to death at least 13 other people and wounded at least 31. The carnage did not end until police ended Whitman's life with several bullets. These images are more of war than of a small fast food restaurant in San Isidro. Yet it was a local man dressed in battle fatigues who declared, I have killed a thousand, I'm going to kill a thousand more. Other guests flee to the balconies, trapped between flames and bullets. A terrified black maid is told, don't worry, we're only shooting whites today. Then the snipers barricade themselves on the roof and shoot arriving firemen. Last night, the bodies were removed from the cafeteria where they had lain since the noon hour. The new pickup truck the killer had driven through the front window was still inside, with blood all over the front of it. He had gotten out of this pickup with a 9mm pistol and began shooting people. That tower has haunted Austin, Texas for more than 40 years. It reminds us that we know plenty about mass murderers but also that we still haven't developed any science that would foil a murderous rampage that's hatched inside a maniac's head and leaves no trail until it's too late. So, sadly, we'll always have victims and survivors about whom we can predict even less. That's because they're the rest of us. I spent a year with the survivors of mass murderers and serial killers. This book is their story. These ten stories explore the moment when these survivors and their killers cross paths, but they also explore how they've coped with the pain over the years and what the ripple effect has been for them. Each is as much about surviving life as it is about surviving the tragedies themselves. These ten survivors all came within a whisper of dying, even as people were dying all around them. Yet each understands that without forgiveness, they rot from the inside out. They don't excuse the behavior of monsters, nor do they deny their own pain. But they refuse to let the monsters darken the rest of their lives. And all of them feel some debt to the dead. Each is aware that to squander this gift, this second life, is to betray what so many others lost. Right here on a summer day in 1966, a college student named Roland Elke was shot by Charles Whitman from that tower. He didn't die that day, although he had one friend who did. Instead, the bullets that hit Roland Elke changed the course of his life forever. He survived his wounds, and he became a minister, a professor, and a father. 
This book is about the capacity of the human spirit to triumph over monsters. Distilling all of this into words and putting them between the covers of a book seems somehow inadequate to me. I'm not even sure exactly how to tell the complete story of what happened or what might be happening still. Or to explain what it feels like to owe a debt to the dead. But I know this. It's spots like this one. It's places just like this. This is where their stories begin. Now here's something we hope you'll really like. And we're back. Joining us, Ron Bransell. Uh, thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Al, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm just delighted to be with you. Oh, thank you. So um, now, now you've, you've done several books, great books. Um, uh, now... Did you um, I, I have to say, did you start out as a true crime writer, or was there something else that came before that? Well, I, in my book writing career, uh, I, w- I wrote a, a literary novel. was my first book out of the box. Uh, then I wrote a couple of of mysteries after that. Um, but the, in my professional career, normally a uh, newspaper reporter and editor. And at the time, uh, The Darkest Night sort of came to me as an idea. I was uh, covering the Middle East uh, for the Denver Post in the in those really turbulent, scary days right after 9-11. And it was coming back from the Middle East when I was done and when I was tired and <laughs> I was... I, I was probably susceptible to to some of those things that your brain does when you're not on guard. That I I saw I began to see this crime against two young friends of mine in 1973, two girls that lived next door to me. I began to see that as um, an. Uh, much like what we had gone through after 9/11, where we went to bed on on the uh, on September 10th, and before we woke up again on September 12th, the world had changed. And this case that I write about in the Darkest Night is like that. We went to bed uh, as this marvelous little ideal little American town on September 23rd of 1973. But by the time we went to bed the next night, our town had changed completely. That wasn't unique to my town, of course. We all go through some some rite of passage like that, some loss of innocence. All of us do. But this is this was a story about when it happened to me, and to the people who lived around me, and so, in that sense, wasn't really writing a true crime. I didn't approach it as a true crime. I approached it as a true story that happened to be about a crime. But I would really wanted to get more into uh, the social study of it, to to dissect this crime, and ultimately, I guess, to explore the nature of memory in a small town. So when you say you're you're dissecting and and trying to get that, uh, how did you go about doing that? Well, I did it the way a journalist would. You know, you you go out there and you just wade around in it. Now, in my day, I'm not that old, but I'm older than than the current crop of <laughs> journalists. Uh, in my day, you did that by getting your boots on the ground and going where it happened. So you could see, so you could smell, so you could taste everything that that uh, everything that you needed to uh, to tell the story, and and that's exactly what happened. I went back to my hometown in Wyoming. I I began to peel that onion, you know. I began to 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 get all the documentation, to get all the pictures, to go to all the places, to talk to the people. And, and to begin to re- reconstruct a story around which 
a certain mythology had grown over 30 years. And uh, some of that mythology truly was mythical. <laughs> it was, it, it, it had grown out of proportion to reality. So I had to, I, I, I really needed to, to rebuild everything and, and to, to, to sort back from fiction and to, you know, go way back in not only my memory, but in a town's memory to tell this story. And it took me, um, I guess a little more than a year, about 13 months to do that. Uh, and then, then I began to write, and the book, uh, the book was was finished, and then nothing. <laughs> you know, we <laughs> we were unsuccessful at selling it, uh, simply because uh, true crime publishing, like publishing of any kind, uh, has has its own little house rules, and they change from time to time. But at the time, the house rules were. A uh, crime that happened more than ten years ago is is really not that interesting, and so we'll pass. And that's one reason we had a difficult time selling it. We finally did sell it to a small publisher, um, uh, who almost immediately turned around and sold the paperback rights to St. Martin's Press in New York. And the book, when it finally came out, uh, became a a national bestseller, and uh, you know the rest is history. What, what do you think? Um, it, it became a national bestseller. Why did it take off? Do you think like that? Like, what was it about this story or this 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 book that you did that made made it take off? Do you have an idea on that? You know, I I don't. I mean, I'm thankful for whatever it was uh, because it 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 expanded what had been a small town's over-the-fence gossip-type story um, to a national level and, and spread the story of these two, the, 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 this night of horror for these two young girls and then everything that comes after that, every horrible thing that comes after that, to a national audience. And suddenly, people were hearing about this who never who who'd never heard about it in the previous thirty five years, uh, and who who suddenly had a, a different view of not only um, this particular crime, but also this this idea of how one one brutal act can send forth ripples that uh, that reverberate through generations and uh, you know we're still i mean in my small town we still can start a conversation with anybody who's been there for the, any length of time in just a few words about this case everybody knows about it everybody has a feeling about it we're actually into a period now where um it's 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 lapsed into this sort of uh the, the mythology of the place too, so that it's it's kind of a cautionary tale. Parents tell their kids, "Hey, you know, be careful when you go down to the store." I once knew about these two girls, you know, and then they tell the story. So it, it's been a fascinating thing, and I think that resonates with people, uh, even if they weren't f- familiar with the story at first. Yeah. I think another thing, though, is. Um, is the personal nature of it. Uh, I, the fact that we have a writer here, a professional writer, who's telling a story in which he was peripherally involved. Uh, and my involvement was purely as a, another kid, the, the kid that lived next door, literally, um, who was affected by this crime. Uh, so the fact that we have somebody with that intimate connection I, uh, it makes this a different kind of story, sort of in the in the vein of uh, James Elroy's My Dark Places or uh, The Stranger Beside Me by Anne Rule. Uh, anybody who picks up the book is reading a book by somebody who was there, 
or at least close. And I think that that seems to resonate with readers. Yeah. I, you know, you've got to realize that it is something special you've done, but um, because it's not about a major, it's not like a Ted Bundy or a Zodiac or something that's a major killing like serial that there's been movies and everything and years and years of it so it's really touched a lot of people you know so it's a that's a special thing i i think it has and of, and actually you know i think so many of the crimes we find ourselves writing about um uh, are are things that we hadn't heard of before certainly but i think they they have this power to 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 both frighten us and to sober us, but also maybe give us some tools for dealing with uh, a lot of difficulties we face in our lives. I, my, I think we might talk about my book, Delivered from Evil. There's a, an example of, you know, telling, telling these horrific crime stories with a purpose. And when we can do that, uh, I think we transcend that that what I call the supermarket true crime, which tends to be um, more pulpy uh, and more more aimed at the people who want you know shock, sixteen pages of shocking photos and lurid descriptions and uh, recitations of the trial transcript. I, I, there, there, there is a, there's a part of the true crime market. That's what they want to read. But there's another part of the true crime market, and I think it was it was really you know, Truman Capote who breathed life into these people, and that's the more literary, more analytical, um, the the. The, the crime story that kind of holds a mirror up to us and shows us ourselves and and really ends up being about us. And I think this, these little these stories like The Darkest Night um, are, are where that gets the most traction, I think, because they are us. And uh, it, it is it is easier, I think, for the reader then to see him or herself in these two girls. And I think also the timing. Um, one thing about 1973, if if we go back to the time, mm-hmm. uh, it, it was it was. Um, I don't want to. I guess it's a lot more naive. Um, I I I don't think the parents. I remember I was 11 years old. Um, for us to go out and play and and stuff was very common. It wasn't so guarded as it is now. Sure, I mean, and I think that that was that was exactly the way we were in this little town, where where you were sort of shoved out the door in the morning on you know on summer mornings, and you might come back around dinner time, and then you're out the door again. And and often I remember our parents would say something like, "Check in when the street lights come on." Yeah. <laughs> uh, or that didn't mean you were coming in. It just meant make sure that you you know drop in and tell us what you're doing. Um, and playing, you know, riding your bike for miles in every direction, and uh, you know, very clear memories of riding my bikes on my my neighborhood streets and. And hearing the people inside the houses, they've got their windows open and their 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 curtains pulled back, and I could see them in there. I, you know, we had this this extraordinary glimpse into other lives, and we felt part of them in in a sense. And so we were free. We were completely free. And that's not to say there weren't any rules, but uh, we were completely free. And yet. Uh, when this event happens and two girls are are snatched basically in a uh, grocery store parking lot by two local thugs and then terrorized through the night and brutalized taken to a bridge out in the middle of nowhere and that means something in Wyoming 
to say in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're thrown off this bridge 12 stories into a canyon, 12 stories deep, uh, and a river below. And one of them dies, and one of them doesn't. Hmm. The story gets uh, provocative from there, but what happened was that that ideal world, that, that, that utopia that we imagined, quickly changed. Suddenly the parents, you know, there was nobody out past dark. Doors were getting locked. You know, your movements were severely controlled. Nobody wanted that to happen again. And we saw that after 9-11, didn't we? I mean, yeah. think oh, about yeah. um, how uh, suddenly after 9-11 we we have a whole new set of rules that we have to live by. And we're suddenly afraid of shadows again. And I, I, I like I say, in that I saw the analog. So, I, again, I, it's not the way the typical true crime book uh, is inspired. <laughs> so it, it came from a little different angle. But it is a true crime. There's no question about that. It just didn't start that way. So now, now when you went back to um, start putting together the the research for the book, it says now you've done more than a hundred interviews. Um, that's a lot of people in a small town. Yeah. How how was the reaction? Like how how were people about this? Like did they were they very open to the idea and did they want to talk or did they want to forget? Sometimes they, you know, they, they, they're all over the lot. Uh, they, they, there was nobody who who just said, "Oh, let let the sleeping dogs lie. Don't do anything." Um, there were people who, you know, confessed they didn't recall much, or there were people who recalled a lot, but it was wrong. Uh, and the, 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 but that was all part of the story, too. Again, how this story had taken on a different kind of, of a legendary life in, in this town. Um, but, no, there was no, no real um, reluctance to talk that, that you know, forestalled uh, doing the book. I think... Um, you, a crime writer always runs into someone who thinks he shouldn't be doing this because, it, like, it's scraping it open or it's giving some notoriety to the killers or, or you know, a variety of reasons. It helped me enormously to have been from that town. I, I think, and I, it's it's been said over and over again since the book came out uh, that. Uh, that one of the saving graces, is, uh, at least from the perspective of the people in the town, is that it was told by one of us. It, it wasn't some New Yorker who came out here and and plopped down and decided to write about a small town in Wyoming. It it was one of us. So, so when I do talk about some of the grittier, darker things. Uh, it's generally accepted. Uh, it's generally embraced. It's generally at least uh, given a pass uh, because I was from there. So I think that helped enormously. Yeah, oh, what must have. Now with uh, Becky Thompson. Now, were you able to talk to her? Well, I knew Becky, of course. Yeah, uh, and. After the crime, you know, she survived that night in the canyon and, and miraculously got herself out of that canyon that was a, the sheer wall um, and went on, you know, and continued her life. And, and I knew her before the crime and after the crime. In the book, I talk about her two lives, and they, were, they, they are divided by that crime. Of course... Um, uh, I can't can't talk too much about this or give away one of the most startling twists in this book, 
Right. But yeah, I knew Becky. I I, she, I couldn't talk to her for this book. Right. Um, but uh, I I I knew her personally, and I knew both of them personally, both victims in this case personally. So, so there were um, two people. So, do, do you want to kind of um, maybe take us to the crime and kind of give us a little overview of what happened? Well, um, uh, uh, hmm, it, it's, uh, it took me uh, about no. hundred times. <laughs> I should have a, an elevator uh, explanation of this, but it's the darkest night is a, is this intimate story about two childhood friends of mine who suffered unspeakably at the hands of a couple killers in the small town where we grew up. And uh, it it involves their abduction from a local grocery store parking lot, uh, their terror, the the, the terror that was inflicted on them by these two guys over over the the, the evening and the midnight, and then being taken out to this bridge and one, the youngest 11-year-old Amy, was thrown off fairly quickly and died. And then Becky, 18, was raped by both of these guys. And then she, too, was thrown off. Miraculously, she survived, and she was able to get, um, she was able to get out. Uh, and and in, a, in a strange sense, she's, she's, she's able to identify her uh, attackers, they are arrested fairly quickly because police, they're, they're familiar to police. Her descriptions, police knew almost immediately who they were. Uh, they're arrested. Um, ultimately, they go to trial and are convicted and sentenced to die. That's the point at which most true crime books end. In some ways, this is, it's where this one begins. Um, there's a whole there's a whole other story that begins at that moment and it has to do with both our our national ambivalence about the death penalty it has to do with um, victims rights it has to do with uh, how we treat um as as a community, victims of crime, it's and and it goes into you know it, it goes into great detail about all of that. So I I would think that at its heart, the darkest night is about one woman's search for equilibrium. She wanted to put solid ground beneath her again, uh, and. She might never have found those answers for herself, but her search sort of leads the rest of us to some answers. I, I think that the process of, me, of, of, of writing this book convinced me that evil's all around us, and we, we simply can't avoid it. And think about that not only in terms of a crime like this, but in terms of terrorism. Um, I I think uh, I I think a life in journalism and this experience convinced me there's really no genuinely safe place in this world. Uh, but it hasn't made me fearful about living life. It's it's just made me understand how important it is to live. You know, as somebody said. Some people are so worried about dying that they never start living. I think that this book is is an outstanding example of of the perils of not living. So uh, that's a that's a kind of airy fairy explanation. <laughs> but it, to me, this story existed on this gritty, real level, and then on this this much more philosophical level. And do you think the system's changed since then, since 1973? Do you think, like, for victims and uh, and uh, the whole process of the death penalty and the way everything goes, 
Do you think it's changed for the better? I think in some ways we've we've we're doing better for victims. You know, back in 1973, there weren't teddy bear memorials, there weren't scholarship funds, there weren't uh, outpourings of support. There certainly wasn't social media. Uh, murder and rape and and violent death were like cancer, right? We we spoke about it in hushed terms. We we couldn't say it out loud, you know. Uh, a little eleven-year-old Amy's funeral uh, was purposely scheduled during the school day so the kids wouldn't go. But for the most part, parents weren't going to let them go anyway because that was the time. They, 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 there was a belief we don't expose children to that. Um, think about that today. I mean, today we'd have grief counselors. We'd have all. None of that happened. So I think we're better in dealing with victims today. Not perfect, but better. Hmm. Uh, as far as the death penalty is concerned, those, those arguments are still going on. Uh, the things that happen uh, to people um, in the system can still be, um, seem unjust, both to people like us, and to people who um, who are against the death penalty and who 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 you know who wants something else to happen, and we we've just never settled it. I mean, everybody's kind of angry about it. So no, in in terms of punishment, no, I don't think we have. In terms of victims, I think we've we've sort of improved how we deal with. Um, I think we sort of we, we do we have improved. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I think we have a ways to go. Yeah. Now, now also now when we go into your Deliver It from Evil book, you also do true stories of ordinary people, and they're kind of faced with something, and they survive. So, I guess my thought is now you you like to write the stories from the victim's point of view uh, yes and no I mean I'm I'm not really writing from their perspective but I'm writing with their perspective front and center I'm writing I, I, I want to tell the story of those people who didn't choose to be in the situation they're in who who now have to deal with it um, uh, that's certainly true in the darkest night and Delivered from Evil was a sort of overt attempt to do that. Delivered from Evil is a book about ten survivors of mass killers. These are just ordinary people like any of us on any street on any given day in America that found themselves suddenly face-to-face -face with either a mass murderer or a serial killer and, by the grace of God, survived. The book explores how these two paths converged and what happens next, but then, uh, then it, it, it goes into how these ordinary folks began to restore some semblance of normalcy to their lives. And I say semblance because in none of these cases do I think they re restored the same normal as they had before. They're just, they just restored something that looks like normal, feels like normal, uh, and that they can live with. And so it's, uh, it was fascinating to do because I spent in, in, in these t with these 10 people, I spent two weeks with each one of them, up to two weeks with each one of them. Uh, and I, I the, the great, the great, the greatest challenge I faced was uh, getting, getting past their natural defenses. Uh, as you can imagine, these were people who didn't, didn't really um didn't really 
trust strangers. I mean, at least one significant time in their lives, a stranger had nearly killed them. So here, here was this guy shows up on the front door and the front porch and says, "Hey, can I? I'd like to tell your story." So our first day or so was usually spent listening to them tell me the story that they'd probably told a thousand times, um, and they 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 were sort of reciting it, you know, just uh, by rote and. Um, after that second day, we began to talk about things that, you know, they hadn't talked a lot about. And by the end of the second week, we were generally, uh, I was generally asking questions that they had never contemplated before, uh, uncomfortable questions. And, and, and by that time, I had built up enough trust with them that they were answering uncomfortable questions. So that was that was a great challenge, but I, but again, you're telling these stories, again, not from their perspective, per se, but um, with with their perspective haunting the whole story. So um, I, I, you know, by the by the end of the year that I had to research this book. Um, I really began to see how extraordinary these ordinary people were. So this is this this book became a book about the human spirit, about resilience and our capacity for triumph. Uh, we all have our traumas and our grief, and uh, yeah, maybe it's a death in the family or a divorce or missed opportunities that drag us down. I, I think. So uh, you can read these stories and, and come to the conclusion that if these people can look a killer in the eye and somehow find their way back to something that feels like normal, then, then there's hope for the rest of us. And that was, that was kind of an overriding theme in the stories. Very, very. Do you um, think that these mass killings have changed now? Do you think they've evolved into something different? So like with the movie theaters and the schools and stuff, something that we hadn't seen back before in the 70s and earlier times? Well, you know, it's funny, funny odd that, that, that you'd say that. I, I, the fact is that the, 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 the dawn of the age of mass murder, particularly mass shootings, is 1949 when Howard Unruh, uh, this World War II vet in Camden, New Jersey, takes a gun and just starts going, walking around his neighborhood, shooting everybody. I mean, he's shooting everybody. Uh, and then, then he goes back to his house and he holds up there until the cops come and there's, you know, there's a siege, and, and he finally gives up. And he was a disturbed uh, collector of wounds. He every, he imagined everybody had it out for him. He 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 never forgot any slight, and everything was a slight. I was struck when I'm listening to the story and reading and watching the story of the the Roanoke. Uh, shooting where the the disgruntled ex TV reporter kills two colleagues in in cold blood on live TV. How at its heart uh, was a, it was kind of the same story. Another collector of wounds who goes on a rampage. He added the 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 the, the element of live TV and then. Horrifyingly, the the social media element of it, but but at their heart, we're still dealing with the same things. If you go through the history of mass murder, you see you you, you see the ones that stand out um, are are obviously the death count is something that that weighs heavily. 
uh, on that. But they also do something that makes it a little more, a little different than than the last one. By 1966, we have Charles Whitman going up in the Texas, the University of Texas Tower, and killing people. You know, we have James Huberty going into the McDonald's in San Ysidro, California, and killing people. Then we have uh, George Kennard driving his truck into the Luby's cafeteria and killing people. Uh, then we have uh, the Virginia Tech shooter <laughs> going through campus and killing people. We have Columbine. People, they're, they're adding these little fascinating bits to this horrible tragedy, right? Think of it as a play that's going on, a tragic play. They're adding some bit of scenery, some bit of costuming, some bit of, of, of technology, something that makes it a little different than the last one. And so that's why they stand out. I think you're correct in saying maybe we're a little different now, and I would say that what's different now is the frequency. And I, I really do think there is a slight uptick in frequency of mass murder, uh, but we ha also have to bear in mind we also have uh, an explosion in media. So things that happened uh, in 2015 uh, that we might not have heard about in 1975 because there wasn't that pervasive media. Right. Um, now we always hear, we hear about all of them, and we're exposed to all of them, so it feels like there's more. Did you also think that's a contributing factor, especially on U.S. media, because it's primarily focused on this? Um you know, like they, they'll, it'll be played over and over and very extensively on yeah. so, something. So uh, more so than when you view other countries' media about this, it's mentioned and it's talked about, but it's moved, they, they just kind of move on, and um, it's not so opinionated. So do you think that's a contributing factor? Do you think that makes it more? I, I, I think that the contributing factor is 24-hour news. I, I think, if, again, let's, let's go back to 75 and think about what we had. We had three channels. Mm -hmm. the, the, local, the, the news programs were, you know, at specified times. All the news of the world had to be jammed into those, you know, half hours or hours, um, you know, around the dinner hour and then at 10 o'clock at night. Um, and and so there really wasn't this opportunity to do that kind of wall-to-wall -wall stuff. We just didn't have time. The 24-hour news channels, though, now have to fill 24 hours. Yeah. So any event, if it's if it's otherwise a slow news day, and and a guy picks up a gun and goes into a theater and and shoots. Um, this is going to probably play for at least 24 hours. It's going to be the lead story for 24 hours, and you're going to see the same 27-second loop of video from outside the theater uh, over and over and over and over again. So and we, we're, we're being barraged by it in this sort of... We're, we're being overcome by a tsunami of information that isn't that much information generally, you know, they're just repeating it over and over. So I think there's that. I think there's a certain information anxiety that we all have. But I do think that that, that media scape is, is affecting, um, a, a affecting those who would do this. And I, I, I think in the Virginia case, we, we see a guy who seemed very intent on using the media scape to, to, uh, uh, as a part of his, his crime. So I, I, that worries me. It worries me to think that we're going to now see people using Twitter and YouTube and Facebook to commit horrendous crimes 
and then and then spread it to the world. Yeah. Uh, the old gatekeepers have lost control of the gate. Yeah. Well, it seems to be a big. Uh, it's a step to basically uh, film it yourself and post it on your own Facebook. Yep. That's, Absolutely. That that that's also. I mean, the last time it reminded me of the Luca Magnata murders. You know, of like or like when he. If you remember him in Montreal when he filmed, behe- you know, the beheading and having sex and that with this victim, and and uh, posting it online, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it was just I, he would have done it live, but they didn't have the technology at the time. <laughs> right. So, right. so it's it's kind of like a progression now. So we can just uh, do it much quicker now. Well, we see ISIS, of course, doing it, and we've seen various punks, you know, videotaping, beating up a bum or beating up, uh, you know, uh, uh, an elderly lady or uh, doing something they shouldn't and posting it and getting caught. But this seems like a deliberate, um, in in the sense that it's deliberate, too, with ISIS, uh, this seems like a very deliberate intent to, to, to use social media to heighten the impact of the crime. And I fear that, that we've crossed the Rubicon on this. I fear that, that, that this is going to be a thing now. This is going to be what a lot of um, uh, criminals uh, will do. And there might even be a little arms race that goes on to see who can do it bigger and badder. And I hope I'm wrong. But I, I fear that, knowing what I know from, you know, 35 years of journalism experience and crime writing, um, I fear we're in for, uh, we, that we haven't yet seen the worst of, of those kinds of, of acts using social media. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think it's also a feed for it, because uh, uh, you know a lot of people are still attracted to watch it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't know how many views that that video had before it was taken down by YouTube. Um, my guess is probably it probably approached a million. So for everybody who says, oh, my God, I don't want to see that, and they look away, there's, there, there's maybe one or two who say, well, I do want to see it. And, and you know, as a crime writer, there's, I have a professional interest in this. I do want to see it. I don't, I don't relish the idea of seeing it. I, 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 my stomach is turned by it. But... If you expect me to tell a story, uh, especially a true story, you know, an authentic story, a genuine story, then I think you deserve to know that I saw it. And even though I'm not going to be writing about the Roanoke, uh, I, I think I, 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 this, this notion began to develop in me when I was uh, covering the Middle East and Danny Pearl was abducted and beheaded it became important to me to watch that video and i did one time that's all i needed uh to understand the people i was writing about to understand the issues uh and to feel not in my head but in my gut what this was about and as a crime writer i'm trying to make you feel in your gut what this story is about. I don't, I want you to read it. I want you to think about it. I want it to affect your, your, your thoughts. But I also want to hit you in the gut and have you get a sense for this on, on a much more visceral, um, much more primitive level. And now, that said, I, I don't tend to be the kind of grisly writer who exploits every drop of blood. That, that's not my interest. I'm talking about some of the horror um, that these two girls might have felt that night, for instance, or the horror of 
of somebody who's confronted by a serial killer in her own home. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't require me to tell you about intestines and blood. It requires me to understand on a very visceral level what scares you, uh, and then and then to show how this is one of those things. So yeah, I think you know there's. There's the storyteller in me, but then there's the human. And as a human, I, I, I'm a little fearful for where we're going. Mm -hmm. uh, the storyteller in me follows suit, but uh, I, I have this belief, I guess it's my journalism, uh, that, that it says, by talking about it, by telling you the story, somehow we'll be better. You know? Um, I, I think... Um, I, I, I think there's some kind of value um, to, 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 to understanding what happened and, and, and how it happened, and at least having the facts available. You might want to look away, I understand that, but uh, um, uh, I, I, my job isn't, isn't to hide anything from you but to find a way to make you feel what happened. And, and, and you do. And um, now, on previous shows, we've had a lot of writers on, and I always ask them if there's writers that influence them or people that they read and uh, anybody out there that they think is excellent at writing. Now, your name came up a few times, and... Probably the most common, uh, uh, let's say, description of, of you is that you're a very descriptive writer. <laughs> and uh, now, who who out there sort of, um, you know, maybe influences or, or, or perhaps you really like to read? Is there, is there anybody out there that um, you can't wait till the book comes out? You know, I, I'm going to confess something to you, and, and, and then I'm going to answer your question. But first, I'm going to a confession. The fact is that since I started writing books almost 20 years ago, um, very quickly after that, I stopped reading books for fun. I, I haven't picked up a book for fun, for leisure, uh, in almost 20 years. Uh, I, I lost my ability to read for fun. Uh, I began to look at books, and when I was feeling something, I, I wanted to see what they did. I wanted to see how they wrote that. How did they do that? How did they make me feel that? Pretty soon it became like a carpenter walking into a house, right? He can't appreciate this beautiful house. He's got to look and see, how did they do that? And that's no fun. That's just not fun. Yeah. So I, I stopped picking up books. I, I, I have not picked up a book for fun. Now, I'll answer your question. <laughs> I have read for research. I have read for book reviews. And I typically read all my, my uh, colleagues True crime colleagues books, uh, you know, either for them or because it's written by them. And that. I'm not really reading for fun, but I'm reading because this is this is something I think we do in our our little small circle. And uh, there, there are so many of them. I think um, with the passing this summer of Vince Bugliosi and and Anne Rule. Uh, I look around and I say, who, who's likely to succeed to the throne of the reigning true crime writer? And I, I'm, I believe that's probably Greg Olson. And I believe Greg is one of the more graceful, uh, elegant writers in the genre. He's doing less true crime now, but, but I still believe he's, he's, uh, he's one of the best if not the best. Uh, 
Steve Jackson is another, and and, uh, and Steve and I are friends going way back from Colorado, and I think that uh, Steve, again, is is a more gritty, um, a a, a grittier writer who knows story backwards and forwards, who understands these characters better than anybody in the world. if if I want to know about somebody, I think I'd go to Steve Jackson. He he immerses himself in characters, um, I, you know. And then and there are a slew of others, and I'll get in trouble if I start naming <laughs> and miss this one. But among the ones that that I admire in crime, Steve and Greg are honestly uh, Caitlin Rother is another who's who has always impressed me. Um, but where my, when you talk about that, that, that the detail in the writing and the vividness of the words, uh, that doesn't come from crime writing. That comes from reading uh, people like Pat Conroy and John Irving and Ernest Hemingway and Jack Kerouac and, and that, uh, that ilk. It comes from a lifetime, up to 20 years ago, of reading classics and reading really good literature, not commercial literature. So I think the way I write is influenced by the way I read. And uh, I, I love... The classics. I love the, the the language. I love turning that all over, and and I keep going back to that idea of hitting it in the gut. I think we do that. I only I only get a, this little dab of ink on a pa- piece of paper to do that. I can't walk up to you and slug you in the gut, but with this little dab of ink and this little piece of paper, I can I can. I can do a little magic, and I, it might feel like I did. So that's that's really my aim. Um, there's some great great writers out there, but I don't. They're they're uh, they're all over the lot. I and you know, like I say, if if I started naming, I'd get in trouble by leaving somebody out. <laughs> that's how it goes. Wow, it's been a a great great hour. I've um, really enjoyed uh, talking with you, and um, I hope that you're able to come back and do it again. Well, I hope so. Call me up. Next year we're coming out with a new book. Uh, it's called Morgue, and I wrote it with uh, one of the world's most celebrated medical examiners, Dr. Vincent DeMaio, and it looks at uh, 12 or 13 of his most fascinating cases from the exhumation of Lee Harvey Oswald to the suicide of of Vincent Van Gogh to murder trial with Phil Spector and so many others. So uh, we've got plenty more to talk about. Wow. What an interesting life you lead. Um, (laughs) That's fascinating. Well, and then some days I mow the lawn. Yeah. (laughs) But but that's good too, right? The balance. The balance is there. So Now, uh, just for anybody that needs to get a hold of you or if they want to contact you or send you some ideas or who knows, how would you uh, say they should go about doing that? The best thing they can do is go to my website, which is www.ronfrancel.com. And, of course, the spelling is strange. <laughs> so it's R-O-N-F-R-A-N-S-C-E-L-L.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to uh, get to talk uh, writing with with uh, with you and and with your your fans. Thank you. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z Talk Radio Network. I'll be back.